Let's turn our attention to Hidayat Ali himself and learn more about what his experience was like climbing Mount Everest. First of all, I want to thank everyone uh, for your all love, support, and blessing for this my expedition. And again, like uh, this Sunday afternoon, uh, again, thanks for all of everyone coming here and part of my this Everest journey. So what I did, like I prepared a couple of slides and uh, the photos and videos, and I want to walk through the journey, what I have gone through. So, so maybe we can start with this. Uh, uh, so first one is we call it a uh, climatization. Uh, so usually uh, climatization is process of like adjusting your body to some unnatural condition. Uh, so in mountaineering, uh, when you go high, the level of oxygen it uh, lower, it uh, slowly decreases uh, level percentage of oxygen. Uh, so you need to adjust your body to the body to low oxygen. Uh, the process of adjusting your body to low oxygen is called climatization in mountaineering. So the way the climatization is done is like uh, you go to a certain height. Uh, when you go to a certain height, height the body understands that uh, there's a low oxygen, so body needs to survive. And what body does, like our brain does, it sends a signal to our body saying that uh, you are in a low oxygen environment, so you need to somehow survive. So what it does, it basically signals the body to produce more red blood cell. So the red blood cell is the one which carries oxygen to our uh, body. So if the count is increased, that means whatever deficit of oxygen, right? And you try to, uh, you try to um, produce that red blood cell so that uh, the whatever less, right, it can adjust your body. So that's kind of a process of climatization. Uh, so when you go up, the signal comes, but uh, on the high altitude, your body is uh, too much on a stress environment. So the process does not go faster. So that to make it faster, you need to go high, then come back again and sleep low. When you sleep low, uh, your body gets rested, then that process is start fast. So uh, if you go high, come down, uh, your red blood cell number of count which goes up. So this is the technique that you use for climbing any high, high, high mountain. So any high mountain, you just go and climb straight away. So it's a process of going up and down, up and down. So that's the word I'll be using, climatization. Uh, second is, uh, I'll be using another term called the summit window. Uh, so usually any average, uh, top of the average, you'll see one Z film here in the top. Uh, that's the storm, snow storm. Uh, that's about like 150 to 200 miles per hour. Per hour. But it's kind of a miracle in the month of uh, month of May, second week, uh, that wind stop. So that's the time where you can really uh, climb the Everest. And that time is called summit window. And usually summit window, maybe for a few days, maybe four or five days, uh, it can do, uh, it can one stress like one to seven days, or it may be for five days, then it stop, the wind come back again. Then again, the summit will be, the window will be there for a few days. So to climb Everest, you need at least four days of uh, clear, clear weather, and that's what we call it summit window. Okay. Uh, so there are three stages of climbing Everest. The first one is uh, it's the trekking stage. So what trekking stage does is uh, like uh, from the Kathmandu. So usually Everest climb happen in May. So all the preparation is stage from the starting of the April. So all the climbers from all over the world, they come to the Kathmandu and they spend about two to three days. So they meet with other team member and expedition company. They will come and they'll take all your gears and they'll, they'll find out if anything need to be buy or uh, last minute shopping, right? So you do in the Kathmandu. So first stage of climbing, you, you fly a small flight from Kathmandu to Lukla. That's the airport. Uh, uh, that's you fly in the morning. Uh, from there, it's about eight to 10 days of uh, trekking to the Everest base camp. So this is the first stage of uh, Everest climbing. So here the goal is not to go fast, goal is to adjust your body to, the, to a high, uh, new high. Uh, base camp is about like 5,300 5, meters. So you start in 200, uh, 200, uh, 2800 meters. So if you can see here, 
uh, first point is called pathing, which is like two, 2610. So here itself, the tracking itself, the climatization process is built. So you first fly to the high, though you are sleeping at 2610. So that's the process we are following all the places. So this map does not have all the other mountain, you really climb side mountain to adjust your body. So after 10 days, you get in the base camp. Uh, th th this is the uh, map of camps just uh, above uh, above the base camp. So there's four camps. So this is the base camp all the way down. Uh, first camp is uh, around 5,000, about 6,000. Uh, and this is the uh, uh, camp, uh, base camp to camp one. Uh, that's a stress is called Kumbu Ice Fall. I have the videos and so This is one of the most difficult and dangerous part of the Everest climbing. So Kumbu Ice Fall is all like uh, a block of ice. Some of them like maybe uh, size of this uh, this building. Some of them like maybe four or five stories. And there are a lot of covers in between. So you have to cross, go through that and go to the camp one. And there's a one special team, team in the Everest. They are called Ice Fall Doctor. So they are the elite Sherpa from the Everest. Uh, Everest all the team and they are the responsible for maintaining this route. Uh, so you'll, you'll see like how this route is maintained, what are the difficulties, uh, there's video for that. Uh, once you get into the camp one, then uh, this is, that area is called up to camp three, uh, below camp three, is called the uh, Western Kum. So this is the valley between two mountains, uh, one is Everest, another is Nupse, and, and that's where the second camp is there, uh, that's the camp two. And above camp two, uh, this again is a state climb. Uh, camp three is about like 7,200. Uh, that part of climb is called the Lhotse phase. There's a mountain, another 8,000 mile Lhotse. So that's the phase of that Lhotse. It's called Lhotse phase. Then the fourth camp, uh, which is also called uh, South Coal, uh, camp four, it's in uh, 8,000 meter. So above 8,000 meter, uh, it's called dead zone. Uh, usually, lot of that uh, that has happened uh, all of the above that uh, 8000 meter and and uh, our body the cell development does not happen above uh, 8000 meter and actually our body cell is start dying above 8000 meter so one of the critical part of uh, everest climbing is how minimum time you can spend on dead zone okay. uh, so this is second uh, second part of the climbing, uh, second stage, which is called rotation. Uh, rotation, so now you came to, from base camp to the, uh, from, uh, from the starting to base camp. So you take about uh, three to four days of rest, then in that time, a lot of uh, training start happening about the oxygen system, how to use that, then ice training. Uh, then second phase is started, it's called the rotation. Uh, rotation is to adjust your body, all the way to the uh, higher camps. So the rotation one is uh, going from the base camp to the camp one. So uh, the, you go from here. Uh, so usually most of, most of the climbing in Kumbo Ice Fall, that all happens at the night. So usually we, we get up around 12, 12 a.m. early morning. And by one o'clock, we start the climbing from base camp. It take about uh, five hours to 17 hours, based on how your body is climatized. So it, in my case, it took like about nine hours to get to the camp one. Then then you sleep one night in the camp one, then you come back again to the base camp. So you are completing the rotation one. So here again, like idea is to climatize your body and uh, your body will not, uh, create a lot of red blood cell if you're in camp one because you are in the stress environment. So you need to come back to the base camp. Then again, you are taking two, three days of rest. Then you start the rotation two. Uh, the target of rotation two is to go from base camp all the way to the camp two. Uh, so it take about 13 hours, uh, 13 hours to get there. So same process, you start around uh, one, uh, one a.m. early morning. Then uh, take some, uh, take like one or two hours rest in camp one, then you get in all the way to the uh, camp two. Uh, so uh, the reason behind you climb at the night, uh, usually uh, this is the ice fall. Uh, 
the sun is actually very bright bright and intense in a high altitude uh, so when sun directly hit on the ice fall the ice become little loose so the re to minimize the death risk you try to climb the whole area uh, on the night so that ice is more intact and chances of accident is less then uh, you get in the camp too uh, usually first day uh, you are really tried you already gone 13 hours climb whole the night here uh, night then once you get in the camp one or so the you will get hit by the sun and it, it is like something like very unusual so here when you climb kumbu ice wall you are climbing around uh, minus 10 to 20 degrees celsius uh, based on the day then once you go western kum uh, it become like so hot like plus 40 to 50 degree and that area is like all the mountains from the bottom on the side it's like a reflection it become like a mirror and a sun will hit you from the all the side so once you get in the top then immediately you take out all your jacket big jackets then you just go like a t-shirt or base layer we call it then you got it so that part is usually not that high in the climbing it's a slowly gradual ascending but challenge is the hot so you are already so tired then <laughs> hit by sun so usually uh, two of my like they got kind of faint on the, that area because it was so hot suddenly so you get uh, camp to around 1 1 1 to 2 pm so the, then uh, after taking you try to take rest but the problem is like you already went to the so high so uh, you will start getting the headache headache and all like you will not able to eat so that night will be kind of uh, just living in a hell uh, so you'll, you'll be in a camp a small camp then most of the time night you'll just get up try to sit try to uh, uh, try to take bed and there are a lot of headache so next day you wake up very early morning so you didn't get a sleep usually so wake up early morning so then you have to go from camp to do the camp three near camp three about 700 meter uh, because uh, our aim is to climatize to the 700 uh, 7000 meter because above that we will be using the supplementary oxygen so body need to climatize up to 7000 so once you go to the 7000 in the morning come back it's kind of a miracle all your headaches and everything is gone so you can sleep like next night uh, like you will just sleep like a baby like you will sleep uh, so well and you wake up in the morning then you again come back all the way to the base camp okay so uh, now your body is so tired uh, so tired so your uh, your acclimatization does not really uh, do a good job in the base camp so you need to go to t line uh, so usually you go to the uh, here uh, if you fly you go to the namse bazar if you track then you go to the here so uh, your aim is to go to a place where a lot of trees there enough oxygen so that you can recover well so in my case uh, i didn't really track back so i took a helicopter and come back to the namse bazar stayed here for four uh, four nights there uh, just, just to recover well okay, okay. Uh, then uh, then uh, uh, when i came back to namse bazar i was there uh, then the whole everybody is the next next target is summit window right when the summit window will come so basically when the uh, that win at the top right when it will stop uh, so my summit window came in like 12 may but the, I'll, I'll go through the details of the summit but uh, the the way you do summit you come to the base camp base camp in the same night you start around 12 uh, 12 am like uh, same same routine you climb uh, climb all the way to the camp two so you stay two nights in the camp two then from camp two you go camp three camp four then uh, all the way to the summit then from summit you come to the camp four then you directly come back to the camp two then all the way to the base camp i'll go details so i'm just getting, going fast with video i'll go to the details on uh, uh, how the whole uh, summit climb was done so for me like Everest was actually a long long dream my childhood dream so when i was 15 uh, i was a part of a trekking uh, trekking expedition uh, in the state of himalayan state of sikkim uh, 
so it was for the three weeks so by end of the three weeks uh, before that i read a lot of about uh, like edmund hillary and Tenzing Norge deer expedition and seeing the Himalay and staying for about three weeks on that trekking uh, trekking expedition. So it's become some kind of my childhood dream. Uh, so fast forward, like everyone here, we came here, then we came in a age, then our family started, so we forget everything. So <laughs> then, uh, so when my daughter, uh, youngest daughter, she born in 2010. Uh, from 2012, I started getting more time. So that's the time then when I was thinking, like maybe I should give it a try. Uh, but initially, I felt myself like a crazy, and crazy, and a lot of uncertainty. But uh, at the same time, some positive thinking was there that, OK, I should at least give it a try. Uh, that time, I was not really thinking like whether I should be able to go all the way top of, but Aim was like, okay, now I should give it a try. If nothing happened, at least some improvement on your health, health will be there. So that, that was initial thinking. So it started that process, uh, process so five, past five years, almost like mostly working on fitness, uh, fitness to get fit myself, and uh, did a lot of hiking here only. And slowly after five years, when I'm getting more confidence, so I start, uh, uh, I want to get the experience. I want to experiment myself, whether in high altitude, whether my body really climatized, or I am I able to do it or not. So I was experimenting with a small mountain. Then on that process, I want to get experience. So I climbed the highest mountain of Africa, Kilimanjaro, El Burris, uh, Europe, highest mountain of Europe, North and South America, uh, Mount Alcagua. So the, some uh, in the summit photo, so after that, uh, after uh, after I submitted the uh, Ankagua, Ankagua is about 7,000 uh, 7, meter, and actually consider is one of the like toughest mountain, and success rate is around uh, 30 percent. Whereas in Everest, it's like 60 to 70 percent, but the Ankagua it's about 30 percent. So after submitting the Ankagua, uh, I said I was in four other mountainer. Uh, they were almost like I was like at that time for around 48. Uh, so other mountainers with me, other three me three member, they were all half of my age, like 121, 22, and 24. Uh, so I was actually able to go with them, submit together all the way top. But while coming down, I was a little slow. But that was kind of a boost and confidence for me, uh, really to like uh, I should give a try, or uh, I got that confidence. So after that. I was thinking, really thinking about to go to the Everest. Uh, so that, that's the confidence. But uh, biggest obstacle was my fear. Uh, so most of the time, like I was to think, like uh, if I go, if I die, what will happen? What will happen to my family? What will happen to the children? Right? It's mostly the fear. Uh, so I sometimes at the night I really think like uh, fully determined. And by morning, when I see face of Zuti and my children. Then immediately, whole whatever determination you have, night, everything goes away. So the, that process took me about like one year. So in so that's the time when I read a lot of books, uh, books on like mostly on the philosophy. And even never I read a Quran earlier, I read the translation also. What I was trying to understand is like kind of uh, a meaning of life more. I think everyone in some Middle East, everybody. <laughs> try to understand what's the meaning of life. I think I, I was also going going through the same phase. Uh, so what I understood is like, uh, if you really want something, if you want to do, uh, you should do it. Uh, whatever outcome is like, a, is, you should just leave the outcome. Uh, if you, the outcome is positive, good, it's negative, but you have done whatever you like. So that's what I understood. And second thing I learned is how to use fear as for my advantage. So most of the time, like 50% of the time when I'm preparing for Everest, I'm like kind of uh, OK. But 50% of the time, I'm not motivated, like kind of feeling lazy. But when I think of that fear, then it, it usually it motivates me to. So if I uh, go for a run that day, if I'm lazy, I, f I think of OK. I, <laughs> if I go and I, was, I could not come back, then that fear actually helped me to be motivated every day. So gone with all, all uh, like first attempt I did last year. So uh, 
one minute. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so I went last year. Uh, last year, then uh, then COVID break out. So uh, when I sign up uh, during the January February that time the COVID was like almost it was last year. It was in very good shape. Uh, like everybody was slowly forgetting. Then I sign up. Then I went to April first week of April to Kathmandu. That time also, like you can see in the Kathmandu, where the people from outside because they are the only people who are wearing masks and nobody is wearing masks. So it's like COVID was not there. But suddenly the second wave, what we call the Delta wave, right? That hit hit the hit the uh, ever, uh, Nepal, India, right? Lot of people died in India in Nepal also, and that COVID also hit in the Everest also. So in last year, out of my nine team members. Uh, five of them got sick immediately, so they had been flown in like within second week. They had been all uh, rescued from the Everest base camp. Then they were admitted in the hospital, and then uh, they were there. So I was surviving for a little bit. Uh, so uh, I survived almost for five weeks. So then I also you know, I also have the same fate. So one day my fate was same. Like they call like <laughs> helicopter. So then again, they put me on the helicopter. So this is where I am. Like I was not able to even working properly. So somebody has to help me to get into the helicopter. Uh, uh, after that, I was there for about a week. Uh, week in the Kathmandu, and came back. Came back. Uh, it was really disappointing to like really come back with sick and all uh, right uh, i was able to actually recover physically very quick uh, within one month i was fully recovered again thanks to Zuti for all take care of uh, me on during that time but mentally i was really broke in the sense like uh, i have prepared for so long uh, i i have to come back so it was really disappointment for me so it took almost two months so slowly i was kind of uh, uh, understanding myself, uh, I thought like maybe I I was putting um, drama myself uh, more than required. Uh, so one day I thought like I have like two way either I should quit and just move on and should not just make the drama in my mind about like whatever has happened, right? The second, is, at the same time, there's a, one other positive thinking was that uh, I was thinking right. I have prepared for last uh, last eight years. Uh, shall I just give up in one try? So that was another like uh, kind of positive thinking come, come on me. At the same time, I was thinking about my children. Maybe I should give a try. Maybe they will some someday they will take me as an example. Maybe if they do something hard and feel like it's too hard or fail, right? They should also give a try. Maybe taking my example. So that was kind of a motivation. Then I start preparing for uh, my second attempt. So here, here I'm going to show all the photos and videos and how, how the. Okay. So this is in a second week of April. So first thing you come and I landed in the Kathmandu. Uh, after that, like uh, usually the company you are with them, right? They were the one who will take care, take care of logistic, food. Uh, transportation, everything. Then, once you landed up a company, Lena uh, Kathmandu, uh, their representative will come. They will receive you in the airport, and they will take care of everything. So the way they receive is always with, just like our Gamosa uh, is in Nepal. They they also do in very similar way. So this is the flight, a small flight you take from Kathmandu to airport, an next airport called Lukla. Uh, I'm here just about to take this uh, flight. Uh, this is inside inside the flight. It's a small flight, 10 to 12 people. You can see it. And this is the first time where you can see see uh, see the Himalayas. You can see it. It's one of the if the weather is good, one of the like a beautiful uh, beautiful flight in the sense like you can see all the big mountains in the world. 
and and usually the flight is a small flight it's a, again like the flight itself is a adventure a lot of turbulence turbulence and sometimes it like just go down like you feel like it will crash but uh, <laughs> then ultimately you land it up into a loop uh, if you go to the web and see like a look you'll see a lot of videos how really plan land here so look is designated as world like uh, highest uh, dangerous airport in the world so you can see a lot of videos here. So this is like a small town, uh, small villages. Uh, villages. Uh, so this is the airport uh, airport runway. It's actually a 150 meter only runway. It's an uphill runway. So the flight uh, get there and then immediately stop. Uh, stop. So there's a lot of videos in, you can see in the YouTube. And once you get uh, early morning in the Lukla, so after breakfast, you start your like a fast hike. So there's some of the team member in my group. So one, the, yeah, he's from India. Uh, this is the another lady from Iran. Uh, she's, she's from Ukraine, uh, Russia. Russia, that's our guide, guide for the hiking. And we have a couple of members over. So this is the first night we're spending uh, at the, the park ding. So this is the loss we, we have stayed here. Uh, so you, you, the track, there's, uh, it's actually a very beautiful track and there are a lot of landmarks. So one of the landmarks uh, is like there's a one, one double, a lot of hanging bridge you'll cross. Uh, one of them is like, uh, this is a double decker, like it's called Hillary Bridge. So this is the one you, you basically uh, go through here, track through it, then you cross that, uh, this bridge. So this is where I usually, a lot of the hanging breeze, and it's very windy. So this is where I'm just uh, going here. Uh, so after that, uh, this is the, uh, this is one of the bigger, uh, biggest village in the whole area. Uh, this place is called God, Namsi Bazar. Uh, you'll surprise actually, whatever you see it here, right? All the buildings and that. Once you're getting in Lukla, uh, there's no motorized any vehicle. Uh, everything is through either through human uh, or animal and sometimes helicopters. A lot of use of a helicopter for emergency. So if you see this house, all the houses, right? The rocks are actually cut it there, but everything is somebody has bring it from uh, below to here. Like it's all like, and this is the town you get everything. Like um, all the food, uh, hotels are small, they call tea houses and tea houses are there. But it's surprised that everything is built by carrying, uh, somebody has carried the, like doors, like the wood, everything is carried and they build this uh, town. Uh, this is the entrance of uh, Namse Bazar. Uh, on Namse Bazar, then you stay two nights here and this is, uh, there's a place top of Namse Bazar. It's again uh, part of acclimatization. You hike about 1000 feet up. Uh, that, uh, that that's the first time you will get a glimpse of the Everest. Uh, it's called Everest View Hotel. So this is the uh, team we are going up. So you can see the Namse Bazar is below. So we are hiking up. So once you at the top that hotel, so this is where you will first see the Everest. So uh, any guess <laughs> which, which one is the Everest? Okay. Uh, this is this is the Everest. So you can see that fume is still there. So this is the second week of April. So the wind is still there. So that means uh, it's not ready like for climb. And when you see the first Everest, right? Uh, your mind like you become excited at the same time, you become nervous also. Like uh, you're thinking like, oh, <laughs> how can I really go there? So that, that's the first. Uh, and this is the track, you go track uh, all the way. and. And uh, this is the way, like base camp is somewhere here. It's uh, like it's still another six days of trekking. <laughs> so this is a little close view of Everest. Uh, this again here. Then uh, this is the spring season. So still you are in the tree line. So there you will cross about, I think whole trek will cross about 10 to 15, uh, this hanging bridges. And again, springtime, the whole area, like a lot of flowers. It's really beautiful. Um, so you will cross uh, many monasteries on the way. And a lot of, uh, those are the Buddhist stupa. So you'll cross many of them. And this is again, like group photo. 
and slowly uh, once you go high the tree line will go away so he started this, this area is uh, like it's called a alpine desert alpine desert is like uh, no big tree a small bush as you'll find so once you did that's you in the photo you will see like once you go up uh, the scenery really changes from like uh, uh, trees to all the rocks and ice so it still go more high there's some um, you need to cross uh, cross one of the like a small stream also and this is the track here okay uh, uh, this is the memorial uh, before uh, still two days to the base camp uh, there's a huge area uh, this is the memorial for uh, Everest like all the fallen areas of Everest uh, so you pass actually pass through this memorial so when I went first time in 2018 I was excited to see taking all those pictures and this thing but uh, when I when last time and this time when you pass this, this area uh, your feelings become mi mixed feeling so it will remind you like what you are going to do like uh, what you are really going for it's remind you so most of the time like uh, most of the time we don't stop here uh, uh, just try to go and like uh, even like everybody was uh, were talking then when you pass the area everybody was silent in the group we just passed this I think it's a huge area I'll see, like uh, there's so many memories. This all those is to far, right? Uh, so your scenery become good, but your step become more difficult and difficult as you go high because lack of oxygen. Uh, uh, so So after seven days of uh, seven days of hiking, so ultimately you'll first see the glimpses of Everest Base Camp. So uh, uh, this whole area, uh, this is this is the Kumbu Ice Fall. I'll go more details on this. And actually, the base camp is built on top of a uh, glacier. Uh, that glacier is called Kumbu Glacier. You can see all the blocks of ice. So there is a lot of erosion and a lot of uh, the mountains they have broken they came uh, so the surface of the base camp is mostly uh, rocks and sand and and you can see like all the all the tents here uh, all the teams they lay their tent so this is about one mile of uh, different team right they lay so it become like a city uh, uh, one of the international tent city and even there is a helipad there are four or five helipads in the base camp and one uh, one temporary medical facility uh, facility so when you see the base camp right uh, you really excited because that's where your target is first target and at the same time you'll feel a little fulfillment at least like <laughs> able to get base camp so many times a uh, lot of people like even before getting base camp so my last last time so three of them get sick like COVID the before reaching the base camp so you Thank yourself, like at least uh, I made the fastest test, I'm in the base camp. So if you're track, track to